Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Professor Paul Gladson and to Setsuko Ono. Uh, well, thank you everybody for coming. It's a great turnout and uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, shed some light on uh, Setsuko's work. Um, usually the mention of critical theory clears lecture rooms, but I reassure you we're not going to be too critical theory this evening. This is mostly an opportunity for Setsuko to, to talk about her work. Um, quite a number of themes um, woven around her work, um, quite a lot of them transnational um, uh, and transcultural in the sense of the commingling of different cultural aesthetics, westernized cultural aesthetics and Asian cultural aesthetics. And also political and critical interests are clearly woven into the work. Um, I think more, some of the more recent paintings um, deal with um, issues of conflict and post-conflict and, and the kind of significant changes that are taking place globally at the moment. All I really want to say to preface that is that uh, uh, there's an opportunity, obviously, to pick up a catalogue, and uh, I'm sure Setsuko is very uh, happy to sign those. But a lot of the themes that we're going to talk about are, are discussed um, uh, further in the essays that are included in the catalogue alongside uh, reproductions of the work. So hopefully, if, if we miss anything, uh, there'll be other uh, things in the catalogue which will help to lead the way on those um, subjects. Um, first question I really want to ask is, I mean, you, you, you haven't always worked full-time as an artist. Uh, you worked for many years for the World Bank uh, in development, which is a, a very important contribution. When did you decide that you, dis that you wanted to be an artist? When did that kind of pivotal moment come along where you made that shift from working with the bank? Well, actually... Uh... I had not really made the um, decision. The work at the World Bank was extremely interesting, but it was um, full of tension because you don't know if you put a lot of time and effort that projects will really lead to development. So the tension was there and I thought, well, I have to relax myself. I need a hobby. And since I was a child, my hobby was a drawing and painting. So I said, well, I should do that. And um, there was a school about a block away from the World Bank. And so I went there to do continuing education. And especially, actually, to learn techniques uh, mainly of sculpture. I wanted to start a sculpture because I've never done sculpture. And uh, that went on, I don't know how many years, but when I was going to retire, so I, I did not make any decision about becoming an artist, but when the retirement age came, uh, I thought, aha, well, I didn't even think about it. Unfortunately for you all, I, I hardly ever think about anything. And uh, so I just said, uh, I just saw a Washington Post article on Havana Biennale. And I thought, oh, well, why don't I try to um, exhibit at Havana Biennale? And my husband is a specialist of American foreign policy. And right at that moment, it was especially concentrated and focused on Cuba. So he was going there almost two or three times a year, etc. So I just gave him the uh, photographs of my work and I said, could you ask them if they want me to exhibit? And the poor Cubans were surprised, but they accepted it. And so I had a wonderful exhibit there. And after that, it just uh, someone from Baltimore um, Public Art Organization um, asked me if I could do the same thing as I did in Cuba. And then there were some Japanese who came to see it, and they said they want ask me to do something in Japan. 
So it just went on like that. And then finally I found myself a professional sculptor. And did you, I mean, with the Cuban exhibition, did you have some pre-existing work or was it the, the offer of the exhibition that came first and then you made the work in response to that? Well, I was always um, working on, especially on sculpture. So I gave them the photo of my sculptures and and, and uh, as the exhibition downstairs shows, I mean, you've, you work across a, a wide variety of media, different materials, different techniques, paintings, sculpture, public works. Um, why the variety? Why, why do you move from one medium to another? Well, first of all, I thought you need to do the variety. You need to learn about each medium. Uh, not because I want to become professional, but... I thought you need to know that. So I went from one medium to the other. And finally, I, dis I discovered that I have not touched steel. And one of the reasons why I have not touched steel was that I hated this fire going and you know welding and cutting and just seemed terrible. So I thought, well, I have to uh, conquer this fear and just try it. And then I tried it, and I loved it. And I decided, you know, not to disperse myself in different medium. Um, and so I took, I focused now on sculpture for a long time. <coughs> Excuse me, I still have leftover flu. But um, <coughs> steel was, is absolutely different from any other medium. Uh, of course, you think of steel as something very heavy, strong, uh, very strong presence. It, it carves out its own sphere. But actually, steel is extremely delicate. You can make it almost fly, and there you can express fragility a movement, and um, I suppose I was a very spoiled child when I was <laughs> growing up. So I loved the freedom that steel gave me, and I still do. That's um, the reason. So part of working across different media is grappling with different... Uh, materials and different techniques and trying to master those techniques? Is that a kind of starting point for you when you move from one thing yes. to another? Yes. Well, but actually, um, I fell in love with all the mediums. Yes. So, and for me, something like wood, for example, um, or stone, it was like beginning a conversation with that material. And I had to listen a lot what they speak to me. Um, so I suppose I took it more seriously, which still doesn't speak to me. <laughs> so I could just, you know, cut and weld and bend and etc. Et so, but but it's not just grappling or mastering techniques. I mean, you're still sculptures. You're using the material in very specific ways but to, you know, deal with particular subject matter and particular content, particular feelings. I mean, in, in your, a lot of your still sculpture, there's a sense of presence and absence and maybe different parallel worlds. I mean, where, where does the transition between grappling with the material and kind of shifting towards issues of content and feeling begin? Where, or do they come together? They come together very um, automatically. And so, um, and I, I saw that in one of your comments, it was very interesting, <laughs> that um, this presence and absence um, seems that it was very prevalent in some of the Chinese art. Um, yes, I, I don't know why, I don't, I've never really studied Chinese art, but it just delights me the fact that you could have complete absence and yet there's a presence. 
So all this um, making holes everywhere, <laughs> yeah, and seeing everything coming through. So my sculptures usually live through the environment, and I'm glad it does not carve out a space by itself. Um, well, that's it. I mean, going back to this question of, of presence and absence, I mean, I'm sure that members of the audience know this, but a lot of what we think of as signature Japanese culture or art, a lot of that is translated from models in China, earlier yes. ways of thinking about painting or sculpture. And, you know, a significant principle, aesthetic principle in China is this combination of shusha, absence, presence, or presence, absence, which is a, a, a dominant part of, I'm sure you're familiar with Chinese painting, uh, landscape painting, where you have absences, pieces of paper, pieces of the support that are not touched by the ink, and then uh, landscape uh, uh, being depicted by ink. And there's an interplay between the surface and the, and the ink in the painting, and also uh, similar things going on in Chinese sculpture. Um, but that's also part of Japanese, the Japanese artistic tradition. What I, and I can see that in your work, I mean, particularly the steel sculptures, where you're definitely playing with um, these issues of absence and presence of form, and then that leads on to, are we in a dream world, or are we in a, an actual space? Um, I'm making a kind of academic reading of that, but were you using those aesthetic principles consciously, or was it something that, came uh, spontaneously just as you were making the work? Well, unfortunately, it came spontaneously and unconsciously. But now that you say it, mm. it seems to me that, um, well, you know, when you are a child in a country, you see a lot of paintings and you see a, a, your own country's art and you don't know that they're influencing you. But I think you're right that I was influenced by the um, traditional art. Um, I, I always loved uh, Chinese painting because it has a lot of emptiness mm. and silence. So I think you're right that, and you know, I think I told you this, but uh, um, museum director of Hara Contemporary Museum said, oh, what you're doing is like the Japanese art of kirie, <laughs> which means uh, is an art where you, you cut things and then you put on shadow. And of course, you know, I have been already a sculptor for 20 years and I said, well, he's right. But I don't know why, you know, I don't know when, I have not l looked at kirie when I was a child either. Hmm. So it's something that seeps into you, I think. Yeah, um, for anybody who doesn't know, this is a, um, it's, it's almost like a child's game. Uh, these are images which fold, and uh, by folding the image or opening it up, it kind of reveals something. There's a kind of shadow image which you read into and you think, well, that's a silhouette of an object. But actually, when the object is revealed, uh, the things that are making the silhouette are completely different. So it's a little bit like a... Buddhist, um, a koan or something like that, where it's like a riddle picture, where you're actually not, uh, you don't have a cert certainty about the, the, the status or the significance of the object that's being portrayed. I think that's right. But you can see that in your metal sculptures, where holes that are cut out of the, the metal signify one thing as a silhouette, and then they almost move into another world. I mean, is there, a, is there a further interplay there? I mean, in Japanese culture, particularly with Shinto, um, there's a strong sense of an animistic world, a kind of uh, enchanted realm, which is coexisting with the real world we live in. Uh, did that have any um, impact on, on your thinking in making those works? You know, I'm not a... I'm very weak in philosophy, <laughs> in philosophy of art. And I have not studied it, but I'm sure that you're right, actually. Well, because um, 
I think this play between realism and dream is something very important for me. And in fact, perhaps I stayed a child. I love it. I love sculpture. I mean, when I do it, it's just, you know, I'm very, very happy. And probably because I'm playing with reality and dreams. I think there's a distinction, though, between your, your work isn't... I mean, the, the interplay between dream and reality that we're very used to in a Western context relates to surrealism. And I have to say, I don't particularly read your works as surrealistic in yeah. that sense. No. And I, I don't think you're neither consciously or unconsciously relating your works to that particular tradition. It seems to me a different kind of interplay, a different kind of relationship between what may be real or what may, may be enchanted. Well, you know, I mean, that's, that's the creativity I hope mm. that I have, that mm. it's not completely a imitation yeah. of certain trends in art. And in fact, um, I've been asked, uh, what is the, what is the, who is the artist who influenced you? What is the um, artistic tradition? And I have to always say that um, I never imitate consciously, because that alone it means that I, you know, someone or something is dictating me to make my work in such and such a way. And what I love in art is this total freedom that I gave myself, of course. <laughs> Linking to that, you, you, you mentioned in passing that you didn't particularly want to think of yourself as a professional artist. Uh, no, more, right. a, more of an amateur. Could you expand on that? Why is that important to you to make that distinction? Well, um, because if you become a professional artist, you are actually obeying a lot of uh, criteria that society puts on you. And if you're not professional, then you are completely free. It's you and your art, your canvas, your steel, your wood. That's all. I, mean, I don't want to emphasize, overemphasize the relationship to tradition too much, uh, because I think that can be overdone. But that desire to maintain an amateur status, again, is very traditional within East Asian arts. It's certainly which, something which comes out of China. It's certainly something which is part of right. the Japanese tradition. Again, do you feel that's something that at least intersects with a, a, you know, a, cultural, uh, a cultural background that you share? From, from yes, Japan? Yes, I think so, yes. Mm. yes. Um, going on from that, I mean, you spent your early years in Japan. A bit when? You spent your early years in Japan, you were schooled in Japan, and I think you, you went to a Catholic school? Yes, I went to a Catholic school. So you went to a Catholic school, but you also studied meditation, I think. Uh, Zen meditation, is that right? Yes, I went to um, Zen uh, meditation. I think you call it differently, but yeah. it's Zen Buddhism um, that practices uh, meditation techniques. And um, I, I went to a temple, very known temple called Myoshinji in Kyoto. And um, you have to sit in a certain way. And uh, I meditated, I think, for 10 days. And uh, the, uh, the monk was so impressed. He said, you should become a Zen Buddhist. But I didn't. <laughs> no, you didn't. You, you, you chose Catholicism. Why did you choose to go in, in that direction in terms of your beliefs rather than study Well, Buddhism. you know, when you're uh, 17, mm. you, have, you don't really have an idea why you choose this or that. And um, Christianism or Christianity seemed to be much more romantic 
Zen Buddhist was dry, it was beautiful, but it was much drier. I mean, it's interesting because I think from a, often from a Western perspective, one might invert that, that Zen seems romantic and limitless and Christian religion can often seem quite dry. So there's a, there's a kind of difference in cultural perspective. I there. think at my age, I agree with you that Zen Buddhist is, is really beautiful. But I not mean, when you were 17. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just you, you see the stone garden and you have all these uh, koan uh, questions which uh, tries to break your rational thinking. Um, whereas Christianism, you know, you have a beautiful Christ, you have beautiful Mary, all these painting, etc. So, but at this age right now, I think Zen Buddhism is, is I, I'm much more taken by Zen Buddhism. I mean, that, that's a very, I, I think, interesting way of putting it, that Zen training is about breaking one's rational way of thinking. And um, certainly as I understand it, that process is about also breaking down one's desiring relationship to the world. So meditation is about relieving oneself of suffering by no longer desiring things. Um, again, do you feel that has impacted on your work? Has, does it impact more on your work now than it did perhaps when you first started to make art? Well, you may be right. It's really, since you know that I'm usually, I'm usually making things without thinking, and I love it that I'm not thinking, I don't quite know why I do this or that. But since you start talking about it, <laughs> I have a feeling that you're right. Well, well, let's try and ground that a little bit. When, when, you, when you left Japan and you were in, I think, New York, or you were in America, um, you were very fortunate, I think, to be at some early performances of John Cage's music. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? That would have been in the 1950s, I think. Well, it, it was fantastic. Um, I went to a concert and I was uh, still an um, early teenager. And um, I was taken to concerts very often by my parents, by my, uh, my, my sister, etc. And here I was in front of a stage, because you know, I was small, but so I was looking at the stage, and it was just full of musicians, orchestra, and there was no sound. And the, afterwards I was explained, well, but you can hear the shuffle of uh, feet, coughing, etc., from the audience, but from the orchestras, orchestra, there was no sound. And I was extremely impressed by the explanation given to me by someone called, with a composer, a Japanese composer, Ichianagi Toshi, and he said, you know, John Cage believes that music is created now in real time. So he doesn't believe that he has to create music two years ago or one month ago, but he wants people to understand that the sound that they make right now is the music. And I was extremely impressed but for many, many years, I forgot all about it. And I was thinking, why do I always think that I have to include the sound or the emotion of the present? Why don't I prepare my sculptures or prepare my canvas? Because then I will not take risks. I know more or less what will come out. 
but it was completely against my thought or my belief. And in fact, I was taking risk all the time because it could have, have come out, sculpture could have come out horribly or painting horribly. Someone asked me during this preview, so what do you do if something goes bad? And I said, I don't do anything. I just go on. And then I saw a very good exhibition of art of a German called Gerhard Richter in Paris. And he said he was very much influenced by John Cage. And then I remembered, well, that was it. I am completely influenced by John Cage. And up to that time, I didn't listen to his uh, work. I didn't see his paintings. But then I did, and, and they're really very beautiful. I think the idea of, uh, some of you may be aware of this, but I think the piece you're talking about is 4 minutes 33, which is often described as a silent piece by John Cage, but of yes. course, it's about the ambient sound, and Cage is very much focused on chance techniques which are derived from the I Ching in China, and also um, the relationship between music and performance and context. Um, is there something of that, particularly in your steel sculptures? I mean, there's some video of your sculptures in, in open space where they, they're just resonating in, in the wind a little bit. Uh, they're not absolutely solid. Yeah. Is there an element there of kind of picking up on the ambient situation in which the sculptures are placed to generate some sense of movement or almost animation around, around the work? And this makes... Um making public sculptures very difficult. Mm -hmm. Because if someone commission you a public sculpture, they want to know what <laughs> is going to come out. <laughs> and uh, I ignore their desire, and I just draw whatever can be, you know, uh, but the sculpture in the dream rather than in reality. And then you go to a steel mill, because I cannot make, you know, huge sculptures. And if you go to steel mill, you as an outsider cannot work with the other workers. You have to stay outside because they don't have insurance, etc. So then the workers are used to looking out at outlines a prepared outline of what to do. And here they see a, a woman. First of all, you know, woman is not very good for steel, but anyway, and um, she comes with nothing. And I had to work eight hours a day for a month with all these uh, fantastic technicians. First, you know, to convince them that I could do something and that they could do something with me. And then we create a sculpture. But actually, most of them I went with to three large steels. They loved it afterwards. But of course, at first, they were very confused. Um, my reading... I mean, both you and Cage are kind of transcultural people, but you're almost the kind of reverse of one another. So, so Cage is looking from a kind of American context and getting interested in Asia and Asian aesthetics as a way of, um, I guess, liberating him from some of the constraints of institutionalized music in America during the early to mid 20th century. You're, you're working the other way. You started in Japan, you, you, know, you come over to America, you choose Catholicism over Buddhism initially, um, but you hear Cage, there's a kind of meeting point. But you're kind of melding those um, cultural traditions in a kind of reverse sense. So what is it that you took from Western art, if anything? Western art or Cage? Western art. Western Re art. Yes, more generally or Western culture, what is it that you might have appropriated from that 
to support you. He really work. asks a very difficult question. <laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> if it was easy, we wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> Western art. Hmm. I mean, for example, you're, you're, uh, we're talking about your metal sculptures, but also your paintings. I mean, there are elements of both which um, connect to uh, ways of working that were part of modernist art in America, like the use of steel, cutting out of shapes, also the expressive brushwork that we find in your painting. I don't look at your work and particularly think that you can connect it to a specific Western artist. You're very individual in that sense. But, you know, that use of brushwork and also the use of materials in that way, did you, were you influenced or did you consciously look towards examples of Western modernist art or postmodernist art as, a, 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 as something that had an impact on your work? Remember, I think from the beginning I said that I don't think I have been influenced by anyone. Mm. Um, I mean, you have trained, obviously. You did have training as an artist. But in many ways, you're a, you know, the best kind of artist, a self-taught or autodidact artist. Um, is there some strength that you draw from that self-teaching rather than being, you know, feeling that you have to conform to some sort of institutional rules about art making? I think you're right. I think there's a strength in it, and it gives me strength. But of course, I had to learn techniques of certain techniques of painting, for example, which is taught in, in Western schools. I had to learn how to chisel wood or stone, um, not so much for the, for the steel, I think. <laughs> I just had to cut it and do whatever I like, but of course I, I've been very much influenced by Western art, and actually I love Western art, so. Let's move on to the content of some of the works. I mean, some of the paintings, larger paintings downstairs, um, address humanitarian issues, conflict, crisis, migration, a lot of the things that have come to characterize the contemporary world. So perhaps you could say a little bit about that. Why did you, or how did you get to the position of feeling that these are things that you wanted to engage with? Well, um, it, it comes about almost accidentally. Um, when I started to read about immigration, it just made me furious. And um, when I was in Europe, I heard about civil war in Spain, um, torture of the Jews, and then the suffering of Palestine, Palestinians. And I also got furious. So I, actually, the, the one that is called uh, resistant to overwhelming force, mm -hmm. um, the title came from Cuba. So I just chose three uh, examples that, that I got to know when, when I came to Europe. And from your point of view, how, what's your intention for us as viewers? I mean, do you have a view about how we should read those images? They're, clearly political images in a certain sense, and you're clearly, one of the things that drives you to make them is anger or annoyance or concern about these things, but do you have a view about how these things should be read by a viewer? What are we, what are we meant to take from that? Particularly in terms of a kind of political or critical position in relation to those events? Well, probably it's, it's, it's actually very bad that I don't have a view of what it could, how it could influence. Mm. Um, I just take the liberty of, you know, pa painting, uh, using some images, etc. But it could have a very bad impact on people, some people, and it could have very good impact on other people. What I mean to say is that 
you can't really paint or sculpt when you're thinking about other people looking at it. Mm. I mean, I cannot. Mm. So I just do it, whatever I want to do. And um, I must say, I was very happy uh, in London because some people liked it very much. But I don't know why they liked it, but you know. I mean, do you feel that art, what sort of role does art have in relation to these events? I mean, art can often seem quite weak and flimsy and perhaps not in a strong position to influence or impact on the world. But, you know, so why do, why do, why do artists like yourself make work which addresses those issues? What's the purpose of that work from your point of view? Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, artists, unfortunately, we are rather weak except if you, if you can get um, the media to back you up. <laughs> but, um, so if you are hoping to influence other people through your art, you might as well stop. So you don't think it influences anybody at all? Or you, do you despair at that idea? That no, no, I'm not in despair <laughs> since when I'm creating, I'm being happy. Yes. So, um, I guess the world that we're living in now, particularly since the turn of the millennium, is one where there have been significant changes. It's a much more connected world. It's a globalized world. Um, you know, with the ending of the Cold War, there have been major shifts in economic fortunes around the world, which I'm sure you were, you know, uh, engage with firsthand when you were working at the World Bank, you know, particularly shifts in economic, cultural, political power from west to east. Um, how is that impacting on your work? Is that something that you're thinking about uh, in terms of the making of your work, that, that historical shift that seems to be happening in cultural interests, perhaps more towards the kinds of uh, issues that and ways of working that you're engaged with in your own work? Well, actually, it hasn't influenced me at all. But I must say, like today, I saw uh, photos of people who went to, um, I don't know if he went to the White House, but they put about uh, 60 pairs of um, sneakers of students to show their anger at American policy on gun control. And I thought it was very, very effective. But you don't know what, you know, what impact it would have. Um, is there any medium or subject matter that you haven't worked with yet that interests you or that you have plans for engaging with with the next body of work that you're going to make? No, I don't. I don't plan ahead. At all? No, not at all. So, paint a picture for us, uh, metaphorically. You're in the studio and you decide to make something. But you're not plan planning ahead. You haven't planned it. You don't particularly have a, a specific No, but I need, I to, need to make the first brush. Right. And after that, I will be able to make the second one. Mm. So your engagement with ideas or content or feeling grows out of the making rather than kind of premeditating what the work is going to be about. And I guess it's about trying to bring the technique or grappling with the materials together with, with the content. How do you know when you've been successful? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think it's when you like it, when one likes it. Uh -huh. So if I like what I have made, I think it was successful. But you don't have any fixed criteria. It's a feeling that you alight on. <clears throat> uh, do you ever feel that something's finished and then have to go back to it? Because you later on decide that it isn't complete? Well, I always know when it's finished. So you never go back and revise it? Hardly ever. Very interesting. 
Well, um, I'd just like to say thank you very much for responding to the questions. And um, I think we could open this up to the floor and, yes, and see, see whether we have some questions here. Have we got somebody no, you, with a microphone? Like yeah. Gentleman over here. Thank you very much. I, I hope my question um, doesn't distract, distract from your uh, own artistic achievements, but so far uh, we, we haven't heard anything about um, Yoko Ono or John Lennon. Um, we are fascinated, of course, by that relationship. Still, it's, it, it's of great interest to us. Is there anything that you could tell us about um, the way in which uh, you've interacted with, with Yoko artistically, and uh, I, I believe it's also been mentioned that John Lennon encouraged you in your artistic endeavours too. Is there anything that you could say about that, please? Well, you probably, if you know my sister's art, it's completely different from mine. So we haven't had any interaction. Um, I took very seriously John's admiration of my sculptures that he had made once, but uh, which meant that I should have stopped working at the World Bank, but I kept on working at the World Bank. So I'm sorry, that's all I can tell you. Another question? Gentleman at the front. Hiya. What's the significance of Guernica to oh. you? Guernica in your work, you know, the Picasso Guernica painting. Gern? Guernica, the painting by Picasso. Oh, Guernica, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Guernica. Northern accent, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> no. Well, I saw the painting. It came to Japan when I was in the last year of high school. And I was extremely moved. And I decided, since he was um, so much against what happened in Guernica, that I will use part of his painting, in my painting, when I did the Civil War in Spain. Yeah. Okay. Does that answer? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm interested in family history. Um, I mean, family is history. Family history. Mm. You were born in 1941. That was the year when Japan and America went to war. And you grew up in Japan right through those war years. You grew up in Japan? No, I'm talking about you here. Uh, and then you went to America. And then you made your life... Oh, I made or you made? You, you made your life away from Japan. And I'm just curious how these very early years might have influenced you and looking at your exhibition downstairs of Aleppo and all the extreme violence that is not portrayed but is behind those, those pictures. I had not thought about it. But for sure, you know, I remember even now the bombardment of Tokyo as a baby, actually. So it may have influenced me. Now, I went to United States um, because my father was asked to establish a Bank of Tokyo in New York. So it was not my choice. Well, is that that answer? Yeah. Uh, just a quick comment on, on, on Guernica. Of course, uh, Picasso was in Paris during the war, and a young German soldier came and looked at his studio, all these dark paintings of violence and um, dark colours, uh, greys and blacks, and said to Picasso, did you make these? And Picasso replied, no, you did. The Nazis did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Seeing as you don't plan your work and it's not foreseen how you're going to project your, what you do, do you think that it's a spiritual need that makes you do it, that's beyond your control, that forces you into that position to, to create this work? It's completely different to the life you used to lead as a banker. Yes, it is. Yeah. It is. And maybe that's why I enjoy it, but um, it's true. What I was doing at the World Bank is quite different from my art. But at the same time, people mistake what, how we work at the World Bank. Actually, when we speak, we have to present everything very logically. But when we work, we have to do it very creatively, intuitively. We have to find out with all the facts that we have about development or development of a country, of a city, of a village. Uh, we have to have creative reaction to it in order to find what could be a solution. And once you find that solution, you try to report it in a very logical way. Now, even if we invest a lot, a lot of money and effort in such a project, it doesn't mean it would succeed. Development is a very difficult project, actually. What I'm trying to get to, the point I'm trying to make is, do you think you're really searching for the origin of your soul through your art? unconsciously if you don't plan any of your work and it just comes on automatically so to speak I, I really don't know maybe maybe I'm doing it unconsciously yes did you did your parents like art or collect art oh yes my father wanted to be a pianist right but that I, I think I must have told you yes and he was prevented because his father asked him to become a banker. My mother wanted to be a painter, and she was prevented because she was a woman, that you're not supposed to have a profession. So art was something very much in my life, my childhood. Every day I heard beautiful music. Well. Did they collect visual art? Was there visual art in the home? Well, you've seen Japanese houses, no? Sure. And they don't have many walls. No. no. Select things. Yeah. Well, maybe I mean, some ceramics you know. and yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like that, yeah. So maybe some select objects. Well, you know. Ceramics. Fact hap something. Ha well, ceramics. Uh, for sure, we had a lot, but beautiful ceramics. But um, when you are a child, you're not going to get that interested in, you know, this art or that art. Well, I didn't. Maybe other children would. Mm, okay, very good. Any other questions? First of all, I'd like to congratulate you for the wonderful exhibition. And uh, um, I'd like to ask you two points. The first is a comment, rather. So you talked about the steel and the material that you'd like to I you'd like, Sorry. You mentioned steel as your favorite material for your sculpture. And uh, uh, last year, I went to see your sculpture established in Tokyo in, in, in Shinagawa. And that time, it was springtime. Uh, beautiful greenery around surrounding your your very large sculpture the structure. However, like uh, Dr. Gladstone, uh, Professor Gladstone mentioned, uh, that uh, there is this aspect of openness and absence, or presence and absence. Uh, so when I was in front of your sculpture. And also the impression I still have of that time is like that sculpture was beautiful. And at the same time, it was kind of dissolved into that background 
of greenness of foliage. And now you mentioned that John Cage, that he, he actually didn't make the orchestra play anything, but the just background was that, was his, well, what he called music. So I just felt it's a very interesting thing that I felt your sculpture actually was dissolving into the, the, the surrounding. Um, in a way, maybe it's, it's a, 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 a combination of merging of this John, John Cage, that sort of the Western culture, and the Japanese-ness, in a way, because I believe that uh, uh, Japanese culture emphasizes the, the uh, nothingness. So that, that, in a way, the fact that, well, you can tell me that if I was wrong, but the, the sculpture you produce kind of defies the materiality. It's, it floats, there is a fluidity, and just it, it immerses into the, in that, the background, especially when I was there. Of course, it would be very different if you place that in a white cube. Of course, you see that material, materiality of the, the, the steel and the sculpture. But I think that was very beautiful. And I think you have that, the picture in the, the in a couple. So Thank was, you, I'm glad. Yeah. So that's the first comment. And the second one is a, is a rather simple question. Uh, I saw your uh, website and the series of paintings that you have produced up to now. And I thought it was very interesting because you, you mentioned that you were not influenced by any specific uh, artists or schools of art. But however, I felt like that you were trying to, uh, to establish your own style because I thought you were going through dra dramatic changes from time to time. Um, so if that's true, having gone through a different period of your well, artistic career or as a painter, uh, do you think you have established your own style, maybe synthesizing everything that you have you know, gone through, or you're still like searching to, to, to come to what, what is the best for you? You can tell me if you know, I'm completely off of what you have been doing. Mm. Do you think, may I ask you a question? Please. I don't know if I understood the question very well. Uh, you're asking me if I'm... reproducing no, my, something that I have mm. seen? No. Uh, when I saw your website, I got the feeling, I received the feeling that you were trying to, to uh, come or produce your own style by, well, I, shouldn't, I don't like the word mimicking, but yes, after different kinds of schools of art or styles because they, they seem to have a change from one period from another dramatically. So in a way, it was very difficult for me to discern your own style. Yeah, signature style. Yeah, you can call it whatever you like. So I'm trying to, uh, what I'm trying to get at is you think you have, you have, you think in you, now this is, this is my style. You're asking if I think I reached a style yes, yes. that I want to reproduce right. in other paintings, etc. Well, I don't know. I, I'm sorry, that's the... I, I, I could add something to that. I think your first comment is very interesting because this word nothingness I think is absolutely right. I, I think what's interesting there is to perhaps compare Setsuko's 
open air sculptures with, let's say, some work by Anthony Caro or David Smith. And actually, I think the difference is, is that those, you know, Anglo American, the Anglo American steel sculptural tradition, the work is very present. I mean, there's, there's a lot of talk about positive and negative space, but if you go and see an Anthony Caro, it's there. Or you go and see a David Smith out in a sculpture park, or even a kind of metal um, casting of a Henry Moore, it's very much present. And that's, a, that, that's very much part of a Western artistic tradition. I think that emphasis on what is present and what is emphatic, and that's not necessarily part of an East Asian aesthetic tradition. Uh, you know, it's something that Cage certainly picked up on, that one emphasizes presence through absence and vice versa. Um, I think the other issue is perhaps that, again, the notion of an emphatic style, again, is a, is, can be a very Western trope or preoccupation. Um, although painters in the, the, the Asian tradition or East Asian tradition would wish to arrive at a personal style, it's usually very late in their career, and it's always based on imitation. It's always based on the principle of imitation. And so the notion of some kind of absolutely personal present style is, is always undercut in that context. So, and I'm not criticizing your questions. I think they're very perspicacious. But I, I think, you know, asking those questions is you shifting perhaps between two different cultural outlooks. But of course, that's the nature of the work that we're talking about as well. Are we done? One more question? Just one more question? Oh, there. There's a microphone on its way. Yes, it is working. It's okay. Yeah. The lady at the, the back there? <laughs> Um, may I ask you, please, as a child through your life growing up, were you talented in sewing, um, decoupage, knitting, flower arranging? Did all these sort of arts follow you through? Uh, dressmaking and, and fashion, did it follow you through your life or did you only just fall into the arts at a later time? Sorry, repeat again, please. What did I do when I was a child? Your childhood, yes. Were you into sewing, dressmaking, you know, decoupage? Did all these arts become of interest of you? No, I, actually I was brought up very free. And my mother, um, well, in a, um, not consciously, but did approve that what I'm doing and never stopped it but never told me to do in something in such and such a way. So maybe that's the leftover <laughs> of what I feel right now. I was extremely free. Thank you. Well, all that remains is for me to thank you very much for your questions and your attentiveness, and above all, to thank Setsuko for being so candid with us and um, answering in, in such an articulate way. And I hope that's opened up um, some interesting ways of thinking about our work. So when you go back to the exhibition and read the catalogue, that's um, provoked some new ways of thinking about what you're seeing and reading. Thank you very much. <laughs>